But you love everybody. The Shabbos. <laughs> what I welcome you to call Haruach. That means voice of the spirit or sound of the spirit. Uh, Messianic fellowship. We're here uh, off of off of Donovan uh, Park Circle. Okay. And uh, we are enjoying the presence of the Lord. And uh, we're enjoying that God's going in, in the world. There are so many people that are afraid and they're thinking of the worst possibilities and the worst outcomes to so many different things. But actually, there's only good coming because our eyes are, are on what the Lord wants. If you would like a copy of the notes and you're watching this uh, online on Facebook Live, then just send an email to Kol Haruach. Uh, my name is Rabbi Elliot Haas at Kol Haruach, K O L H A R U A C H at gmail.com, and I will send you a hard copy. Today's Torah portion is called Toldot. It literally means generations. Okay? Uh, so though its its meaning is is uh, from tol tolda, which really means descendants. Its root word is yalad, which means to bear, to bring forth, to travail. Okay. Um, we're gonna really continue into the story of the son of Abraham Yitzchak, which means he laughs. So you need to learn how to laugh. Okay. If you don't feel like laughing, then laugh all the more. Okay, whatever it takes. Play a funny joke, a clean funny joke. Okay. Well, for some of us, anyhow, some of us want to play other ones. Whatever makes you laugh. Okay. We are to laugh at the enemy. Amen. We are not to be down. We're not to be downtrodden. God has made us to laugh. At the end of ourselves, we laugh, okay? God is gonna have the last laugh over the enemy. Mm -hmm. The enemy's gonna think, oh, look at what we did to his people, look at what we did to this God. But he's gonna have the last laugh, and he's gonna bring his wrath down upon the nations. Okay, so, uh, in this portion, last week, uh, uh, Abraham's servant, Eliezer was sent to get a wife for Yitzchak, who was 37 years old. He married her at age 40. Rivka is, is her name. Rivka means ensnarer. Okay? So uh, there's a meaning to all these. Okay? Isn't it interesting? Remember last week we talked about the fours and the 14s and the 400s and the 40s? And how it's connected to the word square. Talk about that room in the in the tabernacle, in that room where the, the Ark of the Covenant was, and that room in the room in the temple, which ultimately was about Sarah. Last week's portion was called Chaye Sarah, which was all about the life of Sarah, that she represented the new Jerusalem. Well, look at what, what's happening here. The marriage, Yitzchak was married at 40. Okay, it continues. That the, one of the names for the New Jerusalem is going to be a bride coming out, adorned. Okay? Yitzchak was a son of 40. His mother, Sarah, was symbolic of the New Jerusalem. 40 is a number of comfort, and comfort only comes through enduring testing and distress. So you could say he was a son of having his faith tested and proven. And also the son of someone who brings peace and comfort. Forty is also connected with the encounter. We encounter God like Abraham encountered God in two portions of God. This is all about encountering the Lord. Listen, I want as much of the Lord as possible. I want him to be as much as he wants to be. As much as I can handle it. To the point where I'm still conscious. A little bit conscious. Even if it needs to get to be slain in the spirit a little bit. Okay. Listen, we need the Lord. 
we need more of him. He wants us to love him. Intimacy, passion, fire. Listen, it says in, in, in the time when Messiah comes back, it says the feeblest one among them will be like David. David. The weakest one among them will be like David, and David was zealous. That means he wants zealous people. Zealous, fiery people. He doesn't want religious people. He's bored with them. It's so like he wants people that are zealous for him, that are excited, that are, are ready to do anything, believe God can do anything. Okay, this is the type of people he wants. Um, let me read a little bit here at the bottom of page one. Okay, Abraham was symbolic of our father, Yehovah. And Yitzchak is symbolic of Yeshua. His name means laughter, the son of Yehovah. Rivka means ensnarer, daughter of Betuel, which means Elohim destroys. Okay, literally, literally Betuel means Elohim destroys. Okay, but his daughter meant ensnarer. That doesn't sound good, does it? <laughs> Rivka is a shadow, symbolic picture of the bride of Messiah. Now get this, in her marriage to Yitzchak. She was under the covering of her father, which meant Elohim destroy, symbolic of you know Satan coming to destroy, right? Or, or God allowing Satan to destroy. The only thing Elohim or God will destroy is sin. And anyone worshiping and living in sin, when she accepted to be with Yitzchak as her husband, it is like when we accept and believe in Yeshua, he takes away our sin. You understand? So her covering, her father meant destruction is coming. And that's the way it is for every believer without the Lord. We are destined for wrath. But the moment we're joined to the Lord through faith in Messiah, we are literally married to him. Like, like here, uh, uh, sorry, Rivka, Rebecca was married to Yitzchak. You see, there's the same picture here. Okay, so that means her name literally changes. And guess what happens? The woman changes her name. Don't complain that your name has to be changed. Okay? Christina and I had a little difficult with the bank account, you know, when we changed her name to uh, Haas. What do you mean my name has to be Haas? <laughs> Haas. You know. <laughs> Anyhow, a little joke there. Sure, Christina's laughing right now. She's probably listening. She's crazy. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, he, we get a new name. And when we're actually physically married to him, in a sense, not in a sense of a world physically, but when we actually are with him forever, we will have a new name then, too. Okay, so, you know, this is, this is what is... In a shadow form on the earth, this earth is just a shadow, and, and all of our lives and our relationships are a shadow of the heavenly one. Okay, so so this is a far better ensnaring. Remember, her name means ensnared. It's a good thing that she's ensnared by the love, by love of God, by the Son of God, by laughter. She is ensnared by laughter. That's why we need to laugh. Yeshua laughs a lot. We need to laugh. But also there's times when he's pretty angry. Okay. <laughs> but you got to understand the difference. And the only way you understand it is by knowing the times and seasons. Okay. Top of page two. Okay. We need to take back what the enemy has stolen and perverted. All the blessings and the promises and wonderful purposes of God in our life. In our life. Uh, look at Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29, 10 to 14. For thus says the Lord, when seven years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares Jehovah, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. 
that you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart and I will be found by you declares Jehovah and I will restore your fortunes and will gather you from all the nations and from all the places that I have driven you says Jehovah and I will bring you back to the place from where I sent you into exile in other words he's talking to Israel and he said you went to exile but I'm going to bring you back and I'm going to give you everything that I promised you listen we may stray and we may have to suffer the hand of correction, but God will bring us back if we repent, if we seek after him. It says here, if we call upon him and we pray to him and we listen to him and seek him, we will find him. Well, it says when you search for him with all your heart, not when you want to give all of it, your entire being. Look at the bottom of page two. On the fourth day, Elohim were guiding the sun, the moon, and the stars. He is like to teach us by the signs of the heavens, the appointed times, the festivals, for days and for years. In the year 4000, Yeshua came to seal up his bride among the Jews of the Gentile nations. His bride being destined, destined by for testing by God to be made spotless and without blemish. By the blood of Yeshua atoning for her, he purchased her with his blood as his bride. His blood purchased us, yes. his bride. Amen. That was the dowry. He did it. He purchased his bride, us, through his blood. Now let's let's start reading out of out of Tolbo. Starting verse twenty-one. Yitzchak entreated Yehovah opposite uh, no, verse twenty-one of chapter twenty-five. Sorry, Genesis twenty-five twenty-one. Yitz, Yitzchak entreated Yehovah opposite his wife. Because barren was she and allowed himself to be entreated by him, did Yehovah, in other words, I'm going to let him entreat me. Did Yehovah, and conceived, did Rivka, his wife. See, she was not able to have a child. So there was this conception, you know, she, uh, Yitzchak prayed and sought the Lord and she was able to conceive. Now look at what it says. And struggle did the children within her. And she said, if so, why thus am I? Also, I wanted to have a baby, and now you gave me two inside of me, and they're fighting with each other. What's up with that? Okay. If so, why thus am I? And she went to inquire of Jehovah, and Jehovah said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two kingdoms from your inside shall be separated in one kingdom, more than the other kingdom will be mighty, and the elder shall serve the younger. Completed were her days to give birth, and indeed, there were twins in her womb. The first one emerged red, entirely like a mantle that was hairy, so they called his name Esau. I know it says Esau in your Bible, but in Hebrew it's Esau. After that emerged his brother with his hand grasping onto the heel of Esau, so he called his name Yaakov, and Yitzchak was at the age of 60 years when she bore them. Okay. So, let's go down a little bit. First of all, she was barren. And when it seems like there's nothing coming out of our lives, nothing good is happening, that's when we, we seek the Lord out of desperation. Come hear our prayer. You know, a lot, these songs that I picked this week, I'm like, I couldn't believe it, you know? I don't, I don't pick a bass on the Torah portion. I don't do that. But the Lord always does it by the Torah portion. <laughs> you know, the heart of what he's saying. Come hear our prayers. You know, let's you know, seek the Lord while he may be found. Why does Elohim choose the impossible? 
it is because he will get the glory out of our lives, not us. Why should why should not make why should well, I think a little little grammatical error there? Why should things not happen that only he can make happen? It shows his power in us as we yield to him. It was the same with Sarah. We are all barren till we come to God, and this is when we we yield our lives to him. Before the blessing of our fruitfulness, we cry out to God for the blessing. We should not try to make things happen for ourselves because it rarely brings good results. You hear that? Uh, Sarah tried to figure it out. <laughs> okay. Okay, listen, I, I'm too old to bear, so I have a servant, an Egyptian servant, her name is Hagar. So he said, Abraham, marry Hagar, and we'll have a child through her. And then we got Ishmael, we got the entire Arab people from Paris. <laughs> okay, in other words, not to say that the Arab people are bad, God worked it all out, but I'm just saying that we can't get ahead of God. It doesn't usually bring good results. Let God do it. Okay, so, but we make bad choices out of an act of our will that gave us free will. He doesn't want will. God wants us to do it out of our will. That is often why things don't work the way we like it to work. Still, God uses all of it for the good, and when we come to him by repentance, we can avoid all these conflicts. Just listen. We just need to listen to him. Struggle with the children within her. Look at the bottom of page three. Ratsats. Ratsats. Struggle. It means to crush, to oppress. Now, I'm going to do a little bit of Hebrew gematria here. I know Josh is getting all excited right now, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, each Hebrew letter has a numeric value, but we're not going to talk about the numerics right now. I want to just talk to you about the Tzadi. The Tzadi, the first letter in, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the second letter in Ratzatz. By the way, the last two letters are both Tzadis. <laughs> One is a a, a regular tzadi and the other one's a final tzadi. So that's a double tzadi. So the tzadi represents a righteous and upright person. A righteous person often goes through many distresses. That is probably why the Hebrew word distress begins with the tzadi. There's a Hebrew word called tsar. Uh, there are two tzadis in the word for struggle here. And I believe this is symbolic of the two natures and distresses we have to deal with. Yeshua, our Messiah, told us to take the narrow path that leads to life. It is the same Hebrew word for distress from Matthew 7, 13, 14. Turn to Matthew 7, 13, 14. Matthew 7, 13, 14. God's got the whole world in distress right now. Maybe not the distress of violent war, but the distress of soul, not knowing how it's going to go. But for those who are righteous, they know. <laughs> Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And many of those who, who enter will enter by it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And few are those who find it. Why are there few that find a narrow way? Because they like the easy. They like the comfortable. They like the compromise. But in reality, it's bringing destruction upon their lives. The way to lead to destruction is easy, comfortable, compromised. But the way that leads to life is narrow and hard and difficult and a struggle. And here, there are two babies in her womb, struggling. Okay, so, um, the same Hebrew word for distress. The law of sin and death, there's two laws, there's two Torahs. There's a Torah of sin and death. There's a Torah that tells you, don't do that. Don't do this. Do that. Do this. Okay? And, you know, that's just the letter of the law. You're going to break it. <laughs> it's just our nature to go against 
the literal words. That's the law of sin and death. And not to say that it's bad, it has to be done with the Spirit. There's a law of the Spirit. Now we call in Hebrew, there, there's a Yetzer Hara and a Yetzer Hatov. Okay. The Yetzer Hara is the evil inclination, the Yetzer Hatov is a good inclination. I'm getting into some real deep stuff that is taught in, in, in Judaism, but I'm going to make it real simple to understand. There is the way that is the law of sin and death that condemns, and then there's a way of the Spirit. The Torah that leads us to Messiah, that's the Spirit. The Torah that leads us to truth where we rejoice. Yes, it is a struggle to walk in God's ways, but it is a blessing. If your eyes were on him, that is, you're not going to be blessed if your eyes are not on him. You're going to complain. Okay. It is going to be about these twins. One, Esau, represents flesh, and the other, Yaakov, represents spirit. It's a narrow path through them. Okay? We both have in our nature to do right, and we both have in our nature to do wrong. The question is, what are we doing with our will? Are we giving it to the Yetzar Hara, the evil inclination, or are we giving it into the good side of ourselves? That would be the Yetzar Hatov. Uh, this is this is what is inside of Rivka. Okay, you know what? <laughs> Think about it. She can't have a baby, and then she says she pleads, and Isaac Yitzchak pleads with God. So what? God puts two babies in there, and it's a struggle. It's trouble. If you follow God, there will be trouble, but there's a blessing too. Okay, so the two nations in your room, two boys, two kingdoms from your inside, okay, shall be separated, divided. Okay, this is a prophetic thing that's going on. This is symbolic of a future separation in the world between the children of Israel and the children of Rome. The world and all sin, the false teachings, idolatry, Roman religion, and evil living is Rome. That the children of Israel walk by the Spirit. This is prophetic for the struggle just prior to the coming of the Messianic kingdom and leads to the coming of the wrath of God. In the end, he said, let the wheat grow with the tares, and God will separate them at the end. Okay? In other words, the wheat represent the righteous. The tares represent the wicked. This is all prophetic. What's going on in her womb? She is creating spiritually... The, the whole world, okay? Wicked and righteous. Okay, this is a really amazing thing. Okay, so looking at, we, are, we read already up right through 24. Okay, let's read 25 to 26. So the first one emerged red, entirely like a mantle was hairy and they called his name Asaph. After that emerged his brother, I think I already read this too, from his hand, grasping onto his heel, the heel of Esau, and he called his name Yaakov. And Yitzchak was the age of 60 years old when she bore them. Okay. Now, ultimately, in the end, God's going to separate the wheat from the tares. When? Around the year 6,000. It's He's 60 years old when he has these twins. 60 years old. And God's going to separate the wheat from the chaff, like he did with the flood. The wicked got destroyed, the righteous were in the ark. Okay? That's what's that's what's coming at the end as well. Okay, so the mantle that is hairy, look at the bottom of page four. Okay. The bottom of page four. The word sa'ar is hairy. And look at its root word. It, the root word is sa'ar, which means to storm, to shiver, to dread, to bristle, to be afraid. So he, he was hairy. Hairy up here means something to be to dread, to be afraid, okay, to be fearful of, okay. Now the name Asaph means literally it, its word means hairy, but it, its root word is a sa'ar means to accomplish. 
to do, to, to work. So let, let me put it in, in this term. Asav was created to do evil. He was evil. He was meant to do bad. Okay? He was created like that. God makes vessels for righteousness and he makes vessels of wickedness too. But we still have our choice. We can give it to the right or give it to the left. You get that left and the left? People on the left, we don't give it to them. We don't do that. We don't follow those bees. We don't go any deeper than that, than the bees. We follow the right. We do what is righteousness. You know what's amazing? They, they never, the people on the left, they, they're fine using that term. And I think that somehow they must know that being on the left is not right. <laughs> But they don't get it. So like, they're happy in their leftiness. Okay, so there you go. Uh, so Esau <laughs> represents flesh and sin. Yeshua came as flesh without sin to take away all sin. Now look at this. Yaakov, what is it, what did it say? He came out and he was grasping at the heel of Esau. Do you like, do you ever like go and read something and just say, oh, that's nice, and just move on? But that made me say, okay, why is he grabbing the heel of Esau? There's a reason for that. His name, uh, one of the meanings of the name Yaakov means heel catcher. That's where he got the name the heel catcher. Yaakov, because he was, he was grasping the heel of Esau. Yaakov grabbing the heel of Esau is incredibly symbolic of a prophecy in Genesis 3, 14 to 16. Look at it, it's right below here, okay? I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. This is a prophecy about the destruction of Satan at the end. He shall bruise your head. Oh, by the way, when you bruise somebody's head, it means you kill them. Okay. But he shall bruise his heel. In other words, the heel is symbolic of the cross. Satan would get at, at the feet, at the gospel, the kingdom. Try to get him at the heel, okay? So, so anyhow, anyhow, so, so we've got this. Uh, well, actually, here we go. All right, I lost my place a second. Okay, so he's grabbing the heel, symbolic of the prophecy. The action shows Esau, we're back in the middle paragraph, in the middle of page five. The action shows Esau, a symbolic of how Yeshua is the one who would take all sin upon himself. His earthly flesh, and its judgment. However, anyone that will not believe and walks after the flesh is judged already. And that says, and that's the words of Yeshua in John 16, 7 to 11. We, now this is where it's personal to you. We grab the heel of Yeshua that was bruised. Think about this. To be saved, we grab at the heels. Guess what? We are like Jacob. Grabbing at Yeshua. He is one that's been hurt at the heel. It is really our sin that caused Yeshua to give his heel to be bruised, to be, to be hurt. Since it is Yahweh grabbing the heel, this is symbolic of salvation for all the people of spiritual Israel, as well as the promise of salvation to the entire physical nation and the people of Israel. Romans 11, 25 to 27. I'm going to show you something here because your life is in, is in Yaakov. It's not an Asaph. However, much of the world is an Asaph. And, and we've got to stop and leave behind Asaph. Now, listen to me. We've got to stop and leave behind Esau. What does that mean? His name will become later Edom, where we get the word Rome from. We gotta leave the Rome inside of us behind. We gotta get rid of the Rome in us. Roman Catholicism, Roman doctrine that has been passed down. We gotta throw it away. It's Esau trying to get at us. Anyhow, uh, so Yaakov grabbed his heel, symbolic of salvation. Oh, we were at Romans 11, right? Romans yep. 11? 25 to 27. 25 to 27. Which says, I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of the mystery, lest you be wise in your own estimation. 
Now he's talking to the Gentiles that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And thus all Israel will be saved, just as it is written, a deliverer will come from Zion and will remove ungodliness from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. This is a salvation for the whole nation of Israel. Okay? And we are to grab at the heel. The, the Gentiles, the Jews, we grab at the heel. He takes our sin upon himself when we grab at his heel. It's us that is bruising his heel. Our sin is bruising his heel. Okay? So in a way, there was a hope of salvation for Jacob from the time he was in the womb. Grabbing at the heel. Okay? I know this might be kind of deep for some people, but, you know, try to, try to understand. Okay? The, six, the year 60, the fact that he had these, why do you think it says in the Bible he was 60 years old, old when he had them? Okay, 60 years old when Rivka bore them. This represents the year 6000 when Yehovah will show the difference between Israel and the Islamic nations under control of Islam and against the Romanized power and nations of the world, the wheat and the tares, the righteous and the wicked, the coming of his kingdom, and Elohim's wrath upon the wicked on earth versus the wedding and coronation of Messiah for the righteous in heaven. There's two, there's a separation here. There's two ways. There's a way of the world, which is going to bring about destruction of the wicked on earth, and there's the way of God, which is going to bring about a wedding and the coronation of Messiah, and where we are with him forever. Okay? That's the one that I want. The word here for bruise, by the way, I forgot to share that it means to crush. It means to gape upon, to fall upon, to bruise. He was crushed for our iniquities, it says in Isaiah 53. Bruised for our iniquities in some versions. Shoof, shoof. Okay, so I just want you to see Yeshua in, in the story of Yaakov. Okay, let's look at, back. go back to the Torah portion, and let's look at 27 and 28. The youth, now this is after they were born, the youth grew up, and Esau became a man who knows hunting, a man of the field, but Yaakov was a man who was wholesome, dwelling in tents. Now, listen to this. Do you know what the word for wholesome is? Tom. It means perfect before God. <laughs> a man who is perfect, dwelling in tents. Oh, Hanin. Like tent, think about the tent in the, uh, the tabernacles when Israel was a tent in the wilderness. They dwelled in tents, okay? Now look at what it says in verse 28 of chapter 25 of Genesis. Yitz, Yitzchak loved Esau, for he put game in his mouth, but Rivka loved Yaakov. Now isn't it interesting? Yitzchak is supposed to represent God, but he, he was more a fleshy man, wanting Wanted food, wanted to put food in his mouth. So he went after Asa. This is the thing. Do we want to be comfortable? Do we want, we want meat? We want to always have the very best? Okay, we got to be careful because Yitzchak was, he made a mistake here. But Rivka bore these two kids and she was the one that got the prophecy and she knew the older was going to serve the younger. So she was watchful. She was watchful over her son, Yaakov. Hunting, killing a man of the field. In the scriptures, the field represents the world. So he was a man of the world. Now, it says, it says that Esau became a man who knows hunting, a man of the world. In other words, he knows the world. The word for no is yada. It also is the same word for intimacy, passion. When a man is with a woman in, in, in bed, it's passion. It's love. He knew, like a man and woman have a relationship, he knew the world, that he loved the world. He's passionate for killing and in the world. But Jacob was called Tom. It means perfect, complete. Look at this. You see the word here? Who is wholesome? It means literally perfect, complete. To be complete. To be at the end. To be finished. 
He's ready to fulfill Abraham's words and Yitzchak's, what was given from Abraham to Yitzchak to Yaakov. That's why later we're going to see there had to be a deception because Yitzchak became blind. He became bl partly blind because of what, and actually mostly blind, because of what he was doing, because he was caught up in flesh. It's going to blind us, flesh. Okay, so Esau was a man who loved to kill for food and the feel of the world. Matthew 13, 37, 38. Yaakov was a man who knew this was all temporary and does not consider this world his home, following after his father, Yitzchak, and his grandfather, Abraham's footsteps. Hebrews 11, 8 to 10 says this. I'll show you in a second. Esau loved and was intimate with the world and relied on provision from his, the hand of his making. Yaakov was a perfect man dwelling and abiding in humility or a humble and simple life. As Rivka loved Yaakov for everything he was in the spirit to her, it should be the, the same for us. We must love the things God loves and hate the things he hates. This is, this is so simple. We're seeing it. All of us here are seeing it every day in the world. Look at what's going on. Look how split this country is in this election. They, they, they love evil. They want to call evil good and good evil. All the world is against righteousness. Well, the people of God and the people who stand out for righteousness, we're just as many, okay, but, you know, we, we got to get busy. we got to get aggressive. Now, I don't mean aggressive in the flesh. I mean, we've got to, we're, we're supposed to be out there. We are, we're on the offensive. We are not on the defensive. So this is why we have to believe. And we have to press on and stand with the one who God has chosen for this nation, for our president. Okay? Stand up. Be aggressive. Not aggressive and, and, and violent like they are on the left. I mean, be aggressive. Stand. Make your stand. Do not bend to the left or right. Do not doubt. Even though it's so discouraging, we are living out this season. We are living out this portion right now. Okay, so um, there's a lot of scriptures we can look at about this, okay? Well, let's look at the next verses because I'm really like running late here. Uh, 25, 29 to 34. I'm going to briefly cover this. We're going to go over this as brief as possible. Uh, chapter Genesis 25, 29. Yaakov stewed a stew. Y'all like lentils? I like lentils. And Esau came in from the field, from the world, and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Yaakov, now this is literally what it says. How itenu, pour into me now some of that very red stuff. And for uh, exhausted am I, because of this, he called his name Edom. That's where he got his name Edom. It was red stuff. It was a red lentils with stew, probably lamb. Maybe goat, I don't know. Okay. And Yaakov said, sell as this day your birthright to me. Esau said, indeed, I am about to die, so of what use to me is a birthright. Okay, and there's verse 33. Yaakov said, swear to me as this day. And he swore to him, and so he sold his birthright to Yaakov. Yaakov gave to Esau bread and stew and a stew of lentils, and he ate, and he drank, and he got up, and he left. Thus, Esau spurned his birthright. Okay. Now, a birthright means it's a firstborn status. Esau was a firstborn, and his name was Esau. But when he gave that up, he gave his name to Jacob. <laughs> you are now the firstborn. You are now Esau. But... Not in a bad way, like he became like an Aesop type of person. He took on the name. He had a right to the name. He had a right to everything that was going to that firstborn. Okay? He said, pour into me. In other words, pour it down my throat. That's the raw, 
Even before it is finished cooking or stewing, whatever you do, pour it into me. I am so starving. Pour that stuff into me. I don't care about my birthright. That's how he was. Okay? Stewed as stewed. Okay? And um, his name became Edom. Red. It means red. Flesh red. Okay? Cell. It means makal. Makar, sorry, makar. So, to me, your birthright. The Hebrew word for birth, birthright is bikorah. Bikorah. It means the right, the firstborn, to be born first. Your firstborn right. Sell it to me. And Yaakov then gave him bread and lentils, okay, and Esau's sperm. You know what it says in Hebrew? The word is the zah. Very bizarre, isn't it? Baza. Spurn the birthright, despise it, hold the contempt, disdain it. In other words, I don't care about what I'm called to do as firstborn. He was going to destroy the whole future of Israel if it was in his hands. He hated everything about his father. The only thing he liked about his father is that his father is going to bless him one day. He knew the power of blessing, by the way. Okay. Esau was a man bent on accomplishing evil. He married women from a nation that means terrorists. By selling his birthright, to selling his birthright, throwing his name and his firstborn rights away for food, some bread and a bowl of stewed red lentils. He was a fleshly man living by an animal nature. This is a picture of someone who was not born a new or born again into the spirit and despises the spirit of God in his heart. Elohim hates the demonic spirit. God hates this demonic spirit and will judge it severely. That's the compromising spirit. That's why he said, I would rather you be hot or cold. But since you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. He says to the church of Laodicea. Now there's a story this is told by the Jews in the Chumash, it's in your notes, that on the day that Abraham died is, is when Yaakov was making that stew. He was doing it as a traditional mourner's meal for his grandfather. This might have, have made him think about his birthright, making it more precious to him. So in other words, he was motivated because of the seriousness of what was going on. That Abraham died, and soon my father's going to die, and how, who's going to continue on our traditions? So, But I can't because I'm not the firstborn. So he was thinking about his birthright. So he says, I'm going to take the firstborn. So that's what made him think about it. We think it's just something he just did. No, this is what the Jews say. That he was he was mourning his grandfather, Abraham, who died. We don't know that for sure. But, you know. uh, now look at verse chapter 26. We're going to go back to Yitzchak real quick. I just want to share this. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail. There was a famine in the land, aside from the famine that was earlier, that was in the days of Abraham. And Yitzchak went to Abimelech, king of Abimelech, of the Philistines in Gerar, appeared to him in Yehovah, and said, Do not descend to Egypt. Well in the land that I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you, and I will bless you. For to you and your offspring will I give give all these lands, and I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham, your father. I will increase your offspring like the stars of the heavens, and I will give to your offspring all these lands, and they shall bless themselves by your offspring, all the nations of the earth. Now, why do you think he gave it to him at this point? Because he, probably Abraham just died. And so he's transferring it over now to Yitzhak. God is telling Yitzhak. Because Abraham, now this is why I'm going to do this for you. Because Abraham listened to my voice, he observed my safeguards, in other words, my, my uh, observations, my, the things that I created, my commandments, my instructions, my decrees, and my Torah. But wait a second, the Torah wasn't given yet. But God showed Abraham his Torah. Oh, God. God showed Abraham his festivals, that's what the safeguards and, and the decrees were, okay? God said, you watch over to do my times and my seasons, my, 
my things. Because Abraham did that, I'm going to bless you. So what does that tell you? That blessings come upon our lives because we listen to his voice, we follow his, his calendar, his, his, his word that he he's instructs us, his decrees, his word, and his Torah, his instructions, his teachings. So Yitzchak settled in, in Gerar, and when they asked the men of that place concerning his wife, he said, oh, we'll, we'll go into that at this moment. Okay, so look at your notes, bottom of page eight. Abraham listened to my voice, he observed my safeguards, which by the way, observed is connected to safeguards, okay? He observed my charges, okay? Uh, my, he watched. He, he, he followed my commands, my charges, my commandments, okay? And my, my decrees, okay, which is those that were inscribed, labored to be described, my statutes. And, and my Torah, top of page 10, my Torah, my instructions. So first we deal with another famine, right? A chance to learn and be tested by faith that leads Yitzhak and his family to King Abimelech of the Pelishtim, the Philistines in, in Gerar. That Elohim, where God reiterates the promises of blessings to Abraham and his son Yitzhak. This is the faith of Abraham to be a son of Abraham. What does it mean to be of the faith of Abraham? What does it mean to be a son of Abraham? Many in the church who want to disconnect from the Torah say Abraham is our father, for he was a man of faith, a Gentile, who didn't have the Torah, so why do we need it? This is what I've encountered. The fruits of the faith of Abraham is doing his Torah with our will to know him who saved us for eternity. Shall we let the scriptures and the words of Yeshua teach us? Matthew 3, 7 to 11. I'm just going to go through a, a, a few scriptures. This is really important for us to understand. You know, people say, you know, are, we, are you of the faith of Abraham? There's no, we don't need the Torah if you're in the faith of Abraham. Ab Abraham was a Gentile, you know. But actually, Abraham did all these things. So what does that tell you? If we're going to follow God, he's going to reveal the secrets of who he is to us and how we are to live in a way that's pleasing to him. And this is what he gave us. He gave us his Torah. He gave us his, his calendar. He gave us all this stuff. But he wants us to do it out of our heart, not out of you have to do this or don't do that. Okay, so... Matthew 3, 7 to 11. And when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bring forth fruit in keeping with repentance. Do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you, God is able to raise from these stones children to Abraham. But the axe is already laid at the root. Okay, of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Okay, now look at chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 17 to 20. Do not think that I came. This is the words of Jesus now. Do not think that I came to abolish the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter, Hebrew letter that is, or stroke, which is the crown of those some of the letters, shall pass away from this Torah until all is accomplished. Whoever then knows one of the least of these instructions and teaches others shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. What does that tell you? If, if, if you think that we don't need any of the Torah, or teach others that we don't, you're going to be called least in the kingdom. I would rather be called great in the kingdom. We're not talking about now, we're talking about the kingdom. Okay? 
For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, you have to do better than them. Not only are you to do the, the commandments, the instructions of God, but you're to walk in them by the Spirit. <laughs> that word right there, we do it, but we don't do it to obtain righteousness. We do it to know you sure. That's it, period. Okay, now one more scripture. Uh, Romans 9, 6 to 15. I know I'm dragging on here, just hang on. I usually go about an hour, right? Mm -hmm. Romans 9, 6 to 15. It is not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who descended from Israel, who are from Israel. Neither are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants, but through Isaac your descendants will be named. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise are regarded as, as descendants. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. Um, and not only this, but there was Rebecca, Rebecca also, when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Yitzchak. For though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose, according to his choice, might stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger, just as it is written, Yaakov I have loved, but Esau, Esau I hated. There's actually a scripture that says, Yaakov I love. This is God talking. But Esau, I hate it. What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, the next thing we see, we're not going to go into too much detail, but basically, um, Yitzchak. See, there was a covenant made with Abraham about the wells that he had dug, that they would not be filled in. Okay, because you know what? I, I shared with you, I think, last week or the week before that, that the wells that bring out water is clean water, but when you fill it in with dirt, it becomes dirty water, muddy water. It becomes a swamp, so to speak. Does it sound familiar? <laughs> a swamp. Okay, so here's the thing. Uh, the they did not like um, they they liked Abraham, but after Abraham died, now they're they're going to come against Yitzchak, his son. So they filled in all the wells with dirt. So he had to redig them again. And each time he dig them, the Philistines said this. They said, "That's our well." After he dug them. That's our well. Does that sound familiar? That's still happening today. These people who call themselves Palestinians in the land, they are not Palestinians. They are Arabs. The, name, the land was named Philistine, and later in English comes out to Palestine. They, they were, the land was named out by the Romans to mock the Jews that were scattered, and mock the Israelis that were scattered out of the land. The worst enemy of Israel being the Philistines. Okay? So, you know, I just want you guys to see, they're redigging, they're, they're putting dirt in the wells. The nature of the enemies of God is to make mud. It's to turn the water, the pure water, the word, to mud. Okay? We need to take note. When the president said he was going to clean the swamp, he meant it. Okay? So, uh, you know, just keep that in mind. Okay, and the, so they're they're doing. They show no respect, no respect to the son of Abraham. On the three wells, finally they left them alone after the fourth well, and they didn't say that this is mine. But today, every single time, all the time, those who call themselves Palestinians are saying that's mine, that's my land, that's not your land. When you are occupying my land. It's still going on today. Now, these are not true Philistines these that are called Palestinians. They are not true Philistines. But because they wanted to have that name, God honored that. So they have now the, the memory of what the Philistines were like. 
which are bad people. Okay, so what I'm saying is they, they are the ones that are dirtying and muddying up the waters. Of all the, I'm not going to say anything more, but all the Democrats, all the D's in Washington, D.C., not all of them maybe, but most of them, are dirtying the water. They are muddying it. They are making a swamp. And we have to dig it up and clean the water. And actually, our president and those on the right have to clean the swamp. And, and many times, that's us that is a swamp that needs to be cleaned out. But you see, there's a spiritual warfare going on, OK? And we have to be aware of what's happening. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and rulers in high places, OK? Uh, I didn't even get a chance to really get into the story about about how Jacob went to, uh, uh, he, uh, not Jacob, Esau, uh, went to uh, his father Yitzchak and says, hey, uh, no, his father said this to him, I am getting old. I'm going to bless you. I need you to go and make some nice game for me, food, okay? And then I'm going to come and bless you. Well, his mother heard, and remember the prophecy was given her, and, and then told Yaakov, you go in. And he was going to pronounce, he, he said, what if I'm found out? He's telling this to his mother. Jacob, Yaakov, is telling this to his mother. What if I'm found out? My father will be, will think I'm a, you know, I'll, I'll be cursed instead of blessed. Well, this is, this is what she said. His curse be upon me. And I want you to think about that. It, remember when, when Yeshua uh, was presented with, with uh, Bar Barabbas, and they said, they said, shall I release to you your king? And and uh, and they said, no, release to us Barabbas. And he says, listen, this is wrong. I wash my hands of this. This is what Pontius Pilate did. But the, then he, he uh, they came back and said, his blood be on us and on our children. In other words, a curse. Be honest. She was taking the curse upon Rivka was taking the curse. So she became a type of Messiah instead of Jacob, Yaakov being cursed. She became, she took that for her son upon her. But she knew what God had told her when these babies were in the womb. Okay. So he went and he deceived his father. Okay. And that she put a thing of hair for the, it was a hairy man, remember? We talked about the hair. And and there was a deception that went on. But was it a deception? When he said, is that truly, is that truly my son? You sound like Yaakov. But is that truly my son Esau? Uh, and basically he said, yes, I am Esau. But was he sinning against God? No. Because he had a right to the name because Esau sold his birthright to it. <laughs> but yeah, he was, but he was at, under the advising of his mother to do it. So the mother would take the curse upon her. But there, so there's a question as to what was going on here. What kind of thing was happening here? This is all God's will. Sometimes things happen that we don't understand. Okay, and I have a whole little section in here for you to read about it. Okay, and then, and then afterwards he had to leave because his brother he took the blessing, and his brother was only given from uh, from from Yitzhak, you will serve your brother. So you see, that's the only thing he could say. Do you think that Rivka did not tell uh, her husband Yitzhak that she had that the Lord revealed to her? that these two children in her womb, the older was going to serve the younger. He knew. He had to play along in this somehow. So, you know, the, the thing is, in all this, he was frightened. There's a lot of things going on. But he was also playing along with God in all this. And he said, you will serve your brother. And then Esau wanted to kill Jacob. And guess what? It has to stop. The spirit of Esau and the spirit of Rome is still trying to kill the brother Yaakov. And we'll talk more about that in the coming weeks. 
okay, as we read through these portions, okay. But we have a true battle, and that battle is with the world. That battle is with Rome. By the way, the, the Eastern Roman Empire became the Islamic Empire, all of Islam. The Western Roman Empire, it was two lakes, became all of Europe, okay. In other words, the whole world is Rome, okay. And one of these days there's going to be another Roman Empire, and it's probably going to be made up of bits and pieces of both, but it's going to be mixed with clay, okay. And it will not stand, literally, at the feet. A rock is going to come down from from heaven, and it's going to crush it. It's going to become, it's going to crush the feet. It's going to become the kingdom of God. Okay, but anyhow, just for you to see, what, why am I sharing all this? We have got to get Rome out of us. We have got to get the teachings of Rome. It's a, it's a war with Yaakov. It's a war with Israel. It's trying to destroy God and destroy righteousness and destroy the way that is pleasing to the Lord. We have to live in a way that's pleasing to the Lord. We need to follow the narrow path, not the wicked path. And that's, that pretty much covers what I wanted to share. Um, he, Messiah took our curse away. Like Rivka took the curse of his son away. Messiah took our curse away, you know, uh, and, and we are not cursed through his, through his blood. He saved us. And we are with him, and he is with us. Okay? And we got to always remember that he is working all things out to the good of those for those who love him. So let's uh, do the closing blessing. That's oh, nothing. I thought I okay. thought something. All right, let's do the closing blessing, and and then we'll do the run of benediction, and we're gonna have the challah and wine. Uh, some of us have left because of the event, and we will just close with the bread and the wine. And if you guys want to have something back there you're welcome to but we're not going to be here long so we're not going to like put out the table or anything so uh grab something if you want we have something we have some coffee yeah. okay we got uh, a lot of coffee actually yeah we have a lot of coffee <laughs> Amen. Blessed are the people, Lord our God, the King of the universe, who has given us the Torah of truth and has planted eternal life in our midst. Blessed are you, Lord, here we go to the Torah. Amen. Don't shut it off yet. Abba, I ask you would seal this instruction in all of us, Lord. The instruction is that we have the way to go, and it's a tough, narrow path. Struggle, Abba, we're struggling for the truth. We're struggling with you. We want to work with you. We're co-laborers with you. Abba, I ask, Lord, for you to open up doors where people will be hungry to learn your true ways and to reject the false ways. Abba, the ways that leads to death and destruction. We want the way that leads to life. Seal it inside of us, Lord. Let us be like Yaakov and not like Esau. Remove Esau from us. Remove Rome from us. In the name of Yeshua. Yehovah bless you and keep you. Yehovah lift up his countenance upon you and be gracious to you. Yehovah lift up his face upon you and give you peace. In the name of our Sar Shalom, our Prince of Peace, Yeshua Mashiach, Jesus our Messiah. Amen. Shabbat Shalom, everybody.